We're in Revelation, how it all ends. And we're doing an expositional study of Revelation, which means we're looking at the, the factors that help us interpret the Bible, the geography, the history, the culture that surrounds it, the context within the Bible, and we're going to do all that today. And what we're looking at today is, and it's really a question, every one of these chapters, I ask myself a question. Do you, I'm asking myself, do you know God's purpose for your life? And so that takes me to Acts 17. So you guys get your Bibles. Look at Acts 17 with me, because I want to show you how the Apostle Paul shared the gospel. And when Paul shared the gospel in Acts 17, he's sharing it with pagan, unchurched, philosophical, genius people that lived in Athens and, and lived around the Parthenon and lived around the Acropolis and lived around the Agora and the Roman Forum and all the stuff that, that's in Athens to this day. It's still kind of like the cradle of Western civilization, and you all know that. So how do you share the gospel with those kind of people that are really smart, they live around all those carved statues, and they don't believe in your God? In fact, they don't even know him or care. So how do you address them? See, that's what Acts 17 is so beautiful. And so it says, uh, uh, verse 22, Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, men of Athens, and goes through that whole unknown God thing. And look at verse 24. God who made the world. So when Paul shared the gospel, he shares it with three points. He starts telling people that believed in evolutionary thought. Evolution did not start with Darwin. It actually is underlying all the ancient Greek thought. They believed that everything kind of spontaneously came from something, and they didn't believe in a creator. So there's nothing new under the sun, Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, and it's true. So Paul just flat out confronts him with the creator, and that's what he starts. See, the God who made the world and everything in it. Then he goes to verse 27, and look in the middle. He talks about this Savior Redeemer. Verse 27, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, and he's not far from every one of us. He says, all of you need to reach out and, and, and seek, grope, look for your Savior. You need a Savior. Paul, that basically, he told them, they needed a Savior. Why? Well, look at the last thing he says. Uh, the Verse 30, uh, truly, the times of ignorance God has overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day in which he's going to judge the world. So there's the last point. You have a creator, and your creator came down, and he, and he is an arm's length away. That, that verse about grope, grope, you know what grope means? It means you reach out and you, you try and touch. God is close enough to each one of us. If I'm going to grope this pulpit, I have to be, see, I'm not close enough. There, I can get it. God is an arm's length away from every human on earth, including my Peruvian lady that was scared of the war that cut my hair and ask me if I knew God. God was that close to her, and he was knocking. And she said, I ask him to help me know him, to send me someone. And it's, it's wonderful when the person says, and he sent me you. And I thought, wow, she connected the dots, and she's reaching out for the Lord. But if they don't reach out, he's going to be the judge. So look how this affects our purpose. Did you know, first of all, those three points Paul uses is the outline of the whole Bible. The first two chapters of the Bible introduces the Creator. As soon as humanity falls into sin in the third chapter of the Bible, he starts revealing himself, not just as the Creator, but the Creator that's walking around trying to rescue them. Remember where art thou, God said to Adam and Eve in the garden? That's the Savior, the Redeemer. And that's what all the Bible is about until you get to Revelation 5. It's about Jesus coming to seek and to save the lost and that he is the Savior. So the Creator is real, you know, just two chapters. But boy, that Savior Redeemer is the massive part of the Bible. But in Revelation 5, it switches to the judge. And that's starting in chapter 6 to the end. So that's basically the outline of the Bible. But if we know who the creator is, that means we were designed by him. See, this, this is the ultimate series of answers to the questions that people have all over this world. 
Everyone's asking, how did I get here? Why am I here? Where am I going? Those are called the, the fundamental basic questions, no matter what culture you're from, whether you live up in the steppes of Mongolia or whether you're in the Amazon basin, you wonder how you got here more than, yeah, that's my tribe and my parents, but I'm talking about how did my existence begin and why am I even here, especially if you live somewhere where, where life is very cheap, you know, and, and people around you are dying and starving and everything or being blown up, you wonder why am I even here and then everybody really wonders where they're going. And so the Bible says we were designed by him, that's our creator. Those who reach out to the Savior are bought by him, and the judge means we're answerable to him. So that answers the question, my origin, how did I get here, my purpose, why am I here, and my destiny. So that goes back to why we're even in this class. We're in this class to study Revelation. Revelation is asking us a question. Do you know your purpose? Do you know your purpose while you're here? And that's what we're looking at because the book of Revelation was written to a specific targeted group of people that extends to us this day because we're part of them. Uh, if you're a Christian, you're part of the church, the church of Jesus Christ that he bought. And so when Revelation says, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. To the churches, that's the local gatherings of the body of Christ. So the book of Revelation is the most directly written to us book in the Bible. All the other ones were written to the people of Galatia or the people that were living in Pontus, Cappadocia, and Bithynia, you know, Peter's audience. But Revelation was written to those in the churches. That's all of us, anywhere, always. And... It tells us Jesus is looking for something. Now, this is very important for your quiz. Uh, for your quiz, which will be the first thing Thursday morning. What day is today? This is Wednesday, so tomorrow morning. So, um, the, I don't know how you do quizzes here. I sent it off, and they're going to do it, get it to you. I think it comes on your computer. I don't know. But this is very important. This is the outline of the book of Revelation. So basically, and I've shown it to you in an animated way, and I've shown it to you in a chart way, but just in your mind, think about the fact that the first three chapters are all about Christ's church on earth. Jesus is visiting the church, he's walking around the church. The first three chapters, the church is on earth, okay? Then all of a sudden, there's this dramatic shift in everything, and we go from these churches struggling with sin and everything else, all of a sudden, we see this this rainbow encircled throne that looks like a, uh, one of those fair exhibits where they have the, the electric you know, sparks coming out of the ball. You know, that's what the throne looks like. There's lightning proceeding out of the throne and rumbles of thunder and there's fire pillars going, seven of them burning like giant torches in front of this throne. And then we see the, you know, the majesty and high. So things have changed and that's the second part, Revelation 4 and 5, shows the church in heaven. And they're actually getting down on their faces and bowing down. I shouldn't say they, we. Because when you get to chapter 4 and 5, you're looking at the future. How do we know that? Because Jesus said it in verse 19 of chapter 1. He said, I'm going to show you the things which will come in the future. So we're actually seeing ourselves in the future. You want to know what you're going to be doing in heaven? One of the clear things we're going to be doing is bowing in wonder in front of our creator and redeemer and judge and worshiping him. So that's the second part. Then all of a sudden the, the anvil, boom, hits the tribulation events. That's the biggest part of the book, 6 to 18. Now you notice in the second event there's a little bit, did you notice it says Revelation 4 and 5 under Christ church in heaven and then it says 19, 1 to 10? All of a sudden, the church shows up again in chapter 19, getting dressed and ready to go on a trip to Jerusalem. Jesus, in chapter 19, gets everybody at the banquet and gets them all ready, and it's the only time heaven is emptied. How do we know that? Because Jesus said it in Matthew. He says, when the Son of Man comes and all the holy angels with him, it's the only time he empties heaven. That's his second coming. And he brings all the angels with him and all the saints. Jude saw this, remember, quoting Enoch. Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints in the book of Jude, quoting Enoch. 
So we see the church twice, four and five and 19, one to 10. But at the end of the tribulation, a fourth event starts, that's Christ's second coming, that's the second half of chapter 19. And then we have the earthly millennial rule. Now everybody, I wanna show you something. If, if you are from, like I met someone that told me they were from uh, Holland, Michigan. I thought, wow, you need to mark this in your Bible because that's kind of like the uh, Christian Reformed Church capital of the world. And one thing that, the, that one half of all Christianity believes is there's not a millennium. They're sure of that. Isn't that interesting? Let me show you something, what it says in chapter 20. And it says uh, in verse 2, and he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, the devil, and Satan, and they bound him for... Does anybody have your Bible open? What is the, the last three words of verse 2? Read it out loud. Anybody have verse 2 of Revelation 20? Does anybody have a Bible in the room? There we go. Good. Now, don't forget what you just saw. Now look at verse 3. And they cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him that he should not deceive the nations anymore until the... Very good. That's the second time. Thank you. If, if uh, this was a traditional classroom, you know, I would give you the apple. You know how the teachers give the... or the students give the teachers the apple. I'd give you the apple. Thank you. Uh, when the thousand years were finished. But then he must be released for a little while. Then I saw, verse 4, thrones and those that sat on them... Uh, and beheaded for the beast, and it says at the end, they lived and reigned with Christ for, ah, it's the third time. It's, we found it for the third time. And, verse 5, and then the rest of the dead did not live again until, did you know that the word millennium is not in the Bible? Okay? That's what the CRC, that's what Martin Luther, that's what Calvin said, that's what the Methodists say, that's, you know what I mean? That's what the Anglicans say. That's what the Roman Catholics say. They don't believe in the millennium. They're amillennialists. Uh, Word of Life, by the way, is called a dispensationalist school. You all know that, right? Because you know the doctrinal statement and everything and had to sign that you agreed with it or something. You know what I mean when you came here. What's the difference between the covenant Holland, Michigan, covenant theologians, the, the Reformed Church of America, and Word of Life. What is the principal difference theologically? One group does not believe there's a future 1,000 year, and we're only on the fourth time. By the way, it's more than four. It's six times in this chapter. It says 1,000 years, 1,000 years, 1,000 years. Okay. The difference is the covenant theologian people do not believe there's a future for Israel. The dispensational people that read the Bible just believe that a thousand years means a thousand years. And did you know 28% of the Old Testament talks about what Israel's going to be doing during this period that's in... By the way, if I ask you when, or I mean where do you find the millennium in the Bible, look on the screen and tell me what chapter and verses it would be. Everybody read aloud what's inside the parenthesis on point number five. Chapter, verses. So if you're ever talking to someone and they say, do you go to that school that believes in that millennium stuff? Did you know that word's not in the Bible? You go, oh, I, I know it's not in the Bible. I've read the Bible a lot of times. I know it's not in the Bible. Well, first, that's very disarming to them. They go, oh. I thought you believed in the millennium. I said, oh, I do believe in the millennium because when the Bible was translated into the Vulgate, which is into Latin by Jerome, who lived in Bethlehem in the third century, when he did that, he translated the Greek into Latin, and the word for a thousand years is mille annum. M-I-L-L-E means a thousand, and annum, A-N-U-M, in Latin means years. So, just like the word rapture is not in the Bible, right? You've learned that, right? The word rapture is not in the Bible. You can use your logos and, you know, do you guys still use logos? It's not in the Bible. Neither is millennium. 
But both of those words come from the Latin translation by Jerome of the Vulgate, which the Catholic Church used for, still does. And that's how they got into our language, okay? So what is in the Bible is harpazo. I heard Mark Strout talking about it yesterday, right? You guys were listening to him too. And he used that Greek word. But when you translate harpazo in Greek into Latin, it's rapturos. Oh, there's the rapture. It's the Latin translation of the Greek word. And when you translate the thousand years in Greek into Latin, it's muleanum, which is the millennium. Okay, number six, the final rebellion. That's the second half of the chapter in the great white throne. And then finally, we get to heaven. Okay, so now I'll give you a quiz. And you can look at the board. If you're talking about the church on earth, what chapters of Revelation are they? Chapters... Very good. And if you're talking about the church in heaven, what chapters is that in? Good. And if you're talking about the tribulation, what chapters of Revelation are those? Very good. Now, can you do this without looking? <laughs> That's going to be the question. And when you're talking about the second coming of Christ, where would you find that in the book of Revelation? Did you know that, that it uh, multiplies your retention when you use multiple senses? So if you see something, and you say something, and you hear something, it's like it's really stuck. So uh, any of you that want to actually keep saying these things with me, you're actually learning this, believe it or not. And where is the millennium in the book of Revelation? One to six, very good. And where do we find the rebellion in the great white throne? And where, if you want to understand heaven and see what it looks like and see what we're going to be doing, where do you look? So see, there, you guys, that's, that's going to be on both your quizzes and your test. Okay, let's jump in. I'm going to be in Revelation 1, starting in verse 14. Remember, to do an expositional study, we have to decide who is your intended original target, even though it still is very, very applicable to us. Who did God write this to originally? He sent it to John to deliver to these seven churches. Why? Because most likely those seven churches were planted out of Ephesus. Ephesus was the mega church. We'll see that as we study. But look what it says in our little passage we're looking at from 14 to the end. Uh, Jesus starts introducing himself. Now, let me open my Bible to chapter 1, and I want to read to you what he says. 1, 17. And when I saw him, John's giving his testimony, I fell at his feet as dead. Wow. D that should make you pause. This old man, who was Jesus, one of his earthly best friends, when he saw Jesus, it, it just paralyzed him. It's like he had a stroke. He fell like he was dead. That means you don't even move. Wow. And he laid his right hand on me. That's really neat. The Gospels record that Jesus was always touching people. He is the, the one who was in touch. You talk about being in touch. Jesus touched lepers. Jesus touched dead people. Jesus touched people from the street that were defiled. And the Jews believed if you touched someone that their wickedness entered you. And for those that had faith, it did. Did you know that's the best description of the biblical doctrine of imputation and justification? Jesus imputes to us his righteousness, but he justifies us because when he touches us, he absorbs our sin and takes the punishment that our sin deserved and the record that we even sinned. But I'm not teaching through the Pauline doctrines of salvation, so I will just stop right there and you can study justification on yourself. But he touches people as a picture that he takes their sins and their sorrows, as the hymn writer says, and he makes them his very own. God punished Jesus on the cross like he committed every one of my sins. And the instant that my sins were laid on Christ, God doesn't have a record anymore that I did them. That's why God calls us today, sitting in this auditorium, if the Lord was writing a letter today to you, he would say to the saints, 
that are gathered in the J, is this JWC? You guys use initials for everything. Is this called JWC? To the saints gathered in the JWC. What are you called in God's estimation? Saints. How does God look at every one of you sitting in these chairs right now? If he was to describe you with one word, his word is, you're a saint. Do you guys feel like saints? Colby, do you feel like a saint? Does God think you're a saint? No, none of this. God says, if you have called on the name of the Lord, if you have received Jesus Christ, all of your sins, past, present, future, are all on Christ. Jesus was punished by God like he committed every sin that I ever committed. And Jesus, once it's punished, the record that I did anything to merit that punishment all goes onto Christ. So God sees me as if I've never sinned. God will never, ever in the future point his, now he doesn't really have fingers, but God the Father will not point his finger at you and say, you remember what you did? He doesn't do that. He says, I put all your sins on Christ. That's why we're saints. And when you see the one that did that, it's overwhelming. And John saw him and fell down like he was dead. But then look what he said uh, in verse 17. Don't be afraid. I am the first and last. And we start going into all these I am's. And note the sequence. John fell down and Jesus laid his hands on him, which reminds him of that whole process of Jesus' compassion and love and, and how he took our sins. And John, who already had recorded seven I am's in the gospel by John, records eight I am's in Revelation. As you're reading, you can find these. Remember I told you that, that I've read the Bible through, I read it through once a month for years until I got to 100. So I, for eight years, I read the Bible through once a month until I got to my 100th time. Eight years and one month it took. And every time I look for something, this is one of the things I look for. Every name, title, and description of God. He is the rock. I marked every one of those with a blue highlighter. You know, and all of the other titles and descriptions and everything. And then he goes through a lot more. Verse 18, I am he who lives and was dead. So basically, there's my list. I just found these as I was reading through. So what chapter one is all about is God wanted John to see Jesus clearly. And he wanted him to see him as the one that the Bible reveals. And we already know that Genesis 1 and 2 says he's the what? Creator. Jesus is your creator. It's amazing to think about. In chapter 2 and 3, when he walks around the church, he's committed to make us useful all of our days. Why? Because he said, you were bought at a price. I'm your redeemer. See, the one who bought us has a plan for us. You go to Walmart and buy something. You don't usually buy it just because you want to waste your money. You have a plan. You're going to either drink it or eat it or use it, you know, or wear it or something, or listen to it. You're, you're buying stuff with a purpose. God bought us. That's what redeemer means. And then, as we get into the future, which starts in chapter 4, God wants us to know his kingdom rules in heaven and on earth. That's why it keeps fluctuating back and forth. God says, I'm ruling over everything, even though it doesn't look like it from your perspective. It looks like the, the Russians right now are butchering people in that one city that, that's in the news all the time, where they're digging up more people and finding them in the basements and horribly tortured and mutilated. And, and that's on the news. And, and there are a lot of people that are saying, where is God? He hasn't moved, he's still on the throne, and he's still reigning, and he is working all things together for good to those who know him and love him. And he's letting other people see how horrible sin is, because that's what causes war. Satan came to kill, John 10 says, and steal, John 10 says, and destroy. But Jesus said, I didn't come for that, I came to give you abundant life. So that's what basically the outline of Revelation was as Jesus was revealing it. By the way, I, I, when I'm studying in my half hour of each chapter, I, I thought, well, what are those I am's in the Gospel by John? So I wrote them down. Jesus said, I am the bread of life in 635 and the light of the world and the door of the sheep and the good shepherd and the resurrection and the way, the truth and the life and the true vine. And then I started thinking about what does that mean? You know, a lot of times we just think of the facts and we don't think of the implications or the application. 
So I wrote, if Jesus is the bread of life, he sustains us, but without him, we only are totally hungering all the time. Do you know what one of the most deeply felt things? It's hunger. I mean, when you're hungry, you feel it with your whole body. And you know what Jesus says? If you don't have me, your whole world is hungry. You are living a constant, unsatisfied hunger. And if you don't have me, as the light of the world, you're in impenetrable darkness. You don't know what's going on. And if you don't have me, if you don't come in and let me admit you to life, you are excluded forever. Have you ever been going somewhere and they shut the door? Like, you know, going to visit someone in their room and they shut it or whatever, or, or everyone got in the car and shut the door and drove away and left you outside. That's being excluded. Jesus said, apart from me is hopeless exclusion. I'm the good shepherd. You don't follow me and let me care for you. You'll be wandering for life. Do you understand? So I just wrote down all the implications of these. By the way, here's another thing. Quiz time. Everybody sit up. Some of you need to sit up. Do I need to start doing my youth pastor thing and walk down the rows to wake some of you up? Should I walk down the rows and stand by the rows of those of you who, as soon as I start talking, go to sleep? Would that help? You're very kind, front rower. Should I really do that to them? No. Okay. Did you know I was really a bad professor? When I taught at the Master's Seminary with John MacArthur uh, in 1987, the first class coming in, they were so excited, 100 of them. Men moved to Los Angeles to become pastors and be like John MacArthur. You know, they all were so excited. They were in the seminary and I was teaching. And uh, they used to fall asleep all the time because they had families. And most of them went to class at 8 a.m., but they had worked all night as a security guard to earn enough money so they could afford their family being in Los Angeles, which was just horribly expensive. And so I started noticing all these people falling asleep in class. And so I, I in a very calm voice that wouldn't wake up anybody that's falling asleep, I said, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to look at you. If you're sitting right next to someone that's sleeping, I'm going to look at you and I'm going to go, and what you do is you just lean over to them, lightly just bump them a little bit and say, he asked you to close in prayer. I said, would you do that for me? And so the class, everyone that was awake agreed. And so I would be teaching along. After about 45 minutes, I'd go, and they'd go, he asked you to close in prayer. And right in the middle of my lecture, this, this poor fellow would stand up and say, Lord, we're so thankful. This is such a wonderful class. And he would go through this great prayer, and everyone would be snickering, and he'd go, I was sleeping, wasn't I? And he'd sit back down. About the third one I did like that. Guess what? Everyone stayed awake the whole class because everyone was pinching themselves. They didn't want to be asked to pray and know what they were supposed to or not. So, okay, here's quiz time. How many, okay, everyone look at that. See this? Now close your eyes. Come on. Some of you already have them closed. How many books did John write? Say it out loud. Okay, very good. Now you can open your eyes. Um, when he wrote the last one, which is called the book of Revelation, it's the only book in the Bible that the first words are actually the title. Did you know that? What do we call the last book of the Bible? Ah, uh -huh. what's the first verse say? The Revelation. So it's really neat. And I told you yesterday, what's the last line say? This is the only book in the Bible that says what? If you read it or hear it, what? Very good, you get an A but some of you say it out loud, louder, okay? If you read it or hear it, you'll what? Very good. So see, now you've seen it, you've heard it, and you've said it, so you should remember it. Okay, now, we have exactly 10 minutes to cover 11 slides. So one minute per slide. God unfolds a message about the future in three phrases. If you look at verse 19, look at verse 19 of Revelation 1. The Lord says specifically, write the things which you have seen, that's chapter one, the things which are, that's the churches in chapter two and three, and the things which will take place after that, that's chapter four on. That's the outline. This is one of the few books that contains an outline in the book. The book of Acts has it too. You shall be my witnesses in what? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. Yeah, see that's another self-outline book, okay? Isn't it amazing that Jesus explains the calm around the throne before the chaos? Isn't that interesting? The future starts in chapter 4 and 5 with heaven and everything. So, basically this, and I'll animate it for you. 1 through 3 is the church on earth. They're raptured, the word that's not in the Bible. 
uh, but the truth is they come before the Bema Seat. I'm going to talk about that in a little while. While they're up there, the, the anvil, the, the hammer strikes the anvil, ended by the, the second coming of Christ, who comes to rule for a thousand years. And the word millennium is not in the Bible, but a thousand years is six times. I heard you say it. And the rebellion, great white throne, and heaven. So really, what is chapters two and three? Well, one, and then in the next few classes, two and three all about. What does God want his church to do as the earth dies? By the way, you know the earth is dying. You know that, that there are earthquakes in the strangest places, you know that, I mean, and we can blame it on fracking in Oklahoma. They're doing it, you know, or Texas, you know. It's, that's what's, it doesn't matter what's precipitating it. The reality is, no matter what anybody says, the earth is dying. I mean, there are, there are less fish, there are less, there's less breathable air. Did you know that, that birds fall out of the sky in Mexico City because the air is so polluted and they have such little lungs if they breathe it too long while they're flapping along that just kills them and they... It's terrible. That's what's going on in our world. So what are we supposed to do? Save the birds? Is that what God... There's nothing wrong with taking care of your animals. But what, what was the mandate that our Redeemer gave us as his church? See, that's, that's what we're looking at. Well, one thing is, if you belong to Jesus, he wants you to know two things. Everything, it's very simple with Jesus. And it's just like parenting children. I, I parented eight children. And the kids always knew that everything was either pleasing to dad or not pleasing to dad. I didn't have middle ground. And what they would do is they would be running off, scampering off to do something, and every little two-year-old usually does this. As they're running to do something, they look at you, and what does the Bible say parenting encompasses? It says that a good parent guides you, it says in Proverbs, with his eye, as the Lord wants to do. So daddy would be over here, and little one would look at me, and I'd go, and then you'd see their little tiny body go, and they were going between, should I please him or please myself? And you could tell the struggle going on. Did you know nothing has changed? You're a Christian now. And every time you're headed to do something that God in your conscience is saying, mm, shouldn't be doing that, we pause and we look at the Lord and we think about, do I want to please you or please myself? See, there's only two choices on the shelf, pleasing God or pleasing self. And that's the whole Christian life. So, Jesus gives us seven types of believers. Did you know in this room, you are one of these seven? Because these are the seven churches. Either you're distracted, like the Ephesians were, or you're being refined by struggles, like the Smyrnans, or you're compromised, like the Pergamos people, they had secret sins, or you're deceived, like the Thyatirans, or you're dead, stupefied. That's, how the, that's what Jesus says to the Sardis. He said, you're dead. Or you're dedicated, like the Philadelphians. Or you're uncommitted, like the Laodiceans. Did you know, in every church, from the first century till today, until Christ returns, that's the makeup of the congregation. Are you going in the ministry? You're going to have seven types of people in your church. I've been a pastor for 3.8 decades. That's what I had in every church. That list. And you know what our goal is? to get them as they're running off to do some uncommitted, distracted thing, to look back at the Lord and go, whoa, I want to please you. And that's how they turn from distracted and compromised and deceived to dedicated. And that's what the Lord wants. Okay, next we're called to reflect Christ's light in the world. Look, look at verse 20. Look what it says. The mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the the angelos, the messengers, the, actually they're the pastor elders of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands which you saw are the churches. So what, what's our purpose as a church? To be a lamp in an ever darkening world. Well, what's our problem? Well, the book of Revelation tells us the seven greatest problems every believer is going to have in the last days. And what are they? Well, we could be like Ephesus. We could be coasting and not pursuing Christ. 
Or we could be like Smyrna, we could be fearing our persecution. Or we could be like Pergamos, desensitized by sin. Or by, like Thyatira, enslaved. Or like Sardis, acting like a lost person. Or like Philadelphia. Remember he said, you're of little strength, but go through that open door. When I sat there, that Peruvian hair cutter, I had a choice. Did you know all the other people in the barber chairs were listening to me? They all stopped talking when she said, you know God? It got quiet. And I could have said, uh, taper block around the ears, please, you know, and not walk through the open door. Or we could be like Laodicea, distracted. Well, just before we go, I have two minutes and 30 seconds. Let me just tell you one quick story. I got an email, I think it was maybe a year ago, and this person said, you don't know me, I live in London. Uh, They said, "Um, I'm probably your age because I've seen you. I thought, what a strange email to get. Someone in London has seen me. She said, I I went to every concert. She said, starting with uh, uh, the Beatles when they launched in 64 or whatever year it was. And she said, in the Rolling Stones, and the Queen, and she just blah, blah, blah. She said, I've been to every concert. And she says, and I, I went there to get stoned, to get drunk, to get high. And she said, to get, well, I don't know if you're supposed to use all these words here, but to get laid. She said, I was, I was going there for find a guy and, and, and spend the weekend with him and drug and drink and sex and everything. And she says, and then at the end, I would buy the album. And she says, I... I had every album of every concert in England that I'd been to with the date on it, and she says, I had them, the, the album cover on my wall. That was my decor in my house. I thought, what an interesting note to get from someone. So now I've got a tour of somebody's house in London. She says, but, she said, six months ago, I was riding home from a concert. She said, I'm in my 60s. And she said, boy, you don't get as buzzed anymore. She said, in fact, you don't move as fast and you stay away from a lot of that stuff. She said, but I went to another concert hoping to have a buzz. And she said, and I was on my way home riding the subway to my apartment and she said, I started thinking, you know what, you're old and you're sick and you're hopeless. And so she said, I typed into Google, into Google hope. Just the word hope. And she said, all of a sudden, she said, I turned it and I put it in my earbuds and she said, she said, you were talking. She said, you were talking to a, a musical concert group. And she said, it was really short. She said, it was just a few minutes. And I thought, I'm going to watch this. So she said, I was watching it like this on the tube. And she said, you told all this. And then you said, bow your head. So she said, I was just sitting. I was really in it. So she said, I bowed my head. And then I said, God is not far from anyone. If you grope, you, he's within an arm's length of you. Just reach out to him. So she said, I went like this. On the subway in London. You know what, if I saw someone in a seat in front of me going with their head down, I would have probably moved back, you know, a couple seats, wonder, what are they doing? She said, I reached out to God. She said, you know why I'm writing to you? She said, my life has utterly changed in the last six months. She said, I just came up from the the bin, she called it, the dumpster. She said, I took all of my things down from the wall. She said, I don't want to remember that sin anymore. She says, I'm watching all the classes you have online. She says, and I found a church and I'm getting people to come to Christ. Did you know? Did you know you're surrounded by people like that every day? And all we have to do is be a lamp for them.